Good morning. Good morning, Williston. As we do from time to time, we come together in this space to celebrate purpose, passion, and integrity. Three legs of a stool, any one of which gone missing results in something less than excellence. Steve Jobs famously said at a Stanford graduation, you have to, you have to find what you love to do. Today's cum laude inductees have found what they love to do. To continue the program, Mr. Peter Gunn, Secretary of the Cum Laude Association. Good morning. Uh, we gather this morning to honor 10 seniors. Yep, if you carry the one, we got them. Who will, we will induct into the Cum Laude Society. We celebrate their academic accomplishment and in so doing the fundamental mission of the Willis Northampton School. Think of this as the academic counterpart to the athletic awards. Only this is for the very best of the best. The Cum Laude Society is a national honor society modeled on Phi Beta Kappa. Williston Academy joined the society in 1921. The Northampton School for Girls received its charter in 1951. And in 1971, the society granted the merged Williston Northampton School a new charter. Membership into Cum Laude is the highest academic award that Willis and Northampton can bestow. While only a few of you will be recognized today, all of us gathered here can take inspiration from the three words that form the motto of Cum Laude. Arate, meaning excellence, DK, meaning justice, and Time, meaning honor. Excellence, justice, and honor can characterize the life each of us chooses to lead. It can and should inspire the academic and intellectual culture we embrace here, not just in the classroom, but across our campus. On behalf of the faculty, I thank you for striving to live that life as we nurture your curiosity and persistence in the search for truth, beauty, and justice. You have taught us much about language and art, about math, and science, about history and philosophy and faith, above all, about a love of learning. Moreover, we thank your families. We hope they will enjoy today as a reflection of their influence upon your lives. Remember to thank all of those who have helped you to grow your roots and your wings. Why? Because with rare exceptions, our success is not our own. In his acclaimed book, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell reminds us that success comes from multiple sources. We are born with the advantages of our family's DNA, and we grow up benefiting from the resources of our school and broader community. This analysis does not take away from your accomplishment. Indeed, your outstanding record results from your decisions, your choices about taking initiative and working hard to make the most out of that foundation. But recognition of the context of success does require that we, we seek to reproduce or produce afresh conditions that allow each of us to succeed through hard work and determined effort. So when you next look in the mirror, remember the words of John Quincy Adams, as expressed in the film Amistad, that who you are is where you have been. Take inspiration and try to find a way to show your understanding of this fundamental truth. Now if this were the Athletic Awards Assembly, we might try to capture in a few words the ways each of you displayed your intellectual talents, how you became the most valuable player in calculus, wrote a marvelous criticism in literature, kept your eggs safe in physics, expressed yourself eloquently in French, understood the commonality of the world's faiths in religion, and of course, put all of that into a richer context in history. But instead, we address you as a group with this appreciation. Any recognition for academic excellence is an invitation to assume stewardship of the truth. You gained admission by being good at school, by being academically superior to your peers. I urge you to broaden that concept of success, to see the value beyond being the one who is right, to return for one last time to the athletic analogy. It's wonderful to be the one who scores the game-winning goal, but it's truly awesome to make the sweet assist. A true scholar strives to help us all discover greater truth by working collaboratively and putting their discoveries into the surface of humanity. May you embrace the opportunity to improve an ever-changing world. 
As I call your name, please come forward to receive your membership pin and certificate from President Peter Valeen and Vice President Greg Tillet. You guys ready? Mika Shemaluski. It's all about the photo op. <laughs> David Fay. Devin Greenwood. <laughs> Emma Hing. Jilly Lim. <laughs> Keely Quirk. Madison Stemple Pyatt. <laughs> Eric Tallman. How shoe shoe. Zhu <laughs> Jiwan George Zhu. Congratulations, I would ask you all to face the podium so President Valine can read the charge. The academic record you have achieved at school has earned for you membership in the Kalavi Society. This society is a fellowship of scholars whose purpose is to recognize excellence in academic work. It is our sincere hope that you will accept the honor of membership as a responsibility to strive for similar excellence in all future endeavors, and along the way, to contribute to finding solutions to some of the major issues and challenges facing your generation. On behalf of the faculty, I want to thank you for your consistently strong effort. As you have pursued your goals, you have inspired your classmates and teachers, just as you have been inspired by the creativity, hard work, and talents demonstrated by them. By the authority duly granted to me, it is with great pride and pleasure that I welcome you into the Williston Northampton chapter of the Cum Laude Society. Congratulations.
may take your seats. Congratulations, you guys. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Allison Arbib, class of 2003. Allie is a 2007 graduate of Mount Holyoke College with a double BA in politics and French. She is currently the research programs manager, specializing in research on forced labor, child labor, and human trafficking at Verite, an international NGO that works to ensure that people worldwide work under safe, fair, and legal conditions. In her position, she oversees investigation into labor condi conditions at the base of globalized supply chains, including cocoa, cotton, and gold. Allison has experience working in the Philippines, Indonesia, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Burkina Faso. I actually know where that is. I think she might tell you guys. During her time at Williston, Allie participated in varsity soccer and varsity skiing. She sang in the Whittakers, was an editor for the Willistonian, took part in, a vari in various theater productions, and was the president of GSA. Allie speaks English and French. In her free time, <laughs> I didn't know, do you really have free time? No? <laughs> in her free time, she coaches a girls' soccer team and teaches writing at the Adult Learning Center in Holyoke, Massachusetts. She lives in Western Mass with her husband, Sam, and their Dixie dog, Maggie. Please join me in welcoming back Allie Arvin. Thank you so much, Headmaster Hill. Um, welcome to the parents, faculty, staff, and guests. Thank you for inviting me. Really, it's an honor to be here. Congratulations to the cum laude inductees of 2013. Yeah. so hard to get here. You've worked hard for the brilliant and kind teachers who demanded it of you. You spent freezing dark Tuesday nights in December, going from sports practice to play rehearsal, staying up until 2 a.m. studying for your Spanish test the next day, only to wake up at 6 to do your calculus homework. And maybe after that Spanish test, you scrawled notes on Emily Dickinson's poems for your AP English class before racing across the quad to the schoolhouse. And if you were lucky, maybe you avoided the unit. <laughs> or maybe your homework is always done early. Maybe you would never be caught dashing something off at the last minute. I don't know your life, just mine. But what I do know is that by achieving cum laude, you have achieved academic excellence. Congratulations again, this is a big achievement. You've worked hard for it in every day in big ways and small. I may not know you guys personally, but I know the people who sat in those rows in my class of 2003, and if you're anything like them, you haven't just excelled academically, you've excelled in sports, music, theater, the arts, and leadership. I admire you, and I know that there's other brilliance all around in this Williston community gathered here today. So. <laughs> because I admire you so much and I'm so happy for you, I wanted to make this speech special for you all to mark this lofty achievement. It will, if all works out, include neuroscience, marriage equality, the end of modern day slavery, and bears. <laughs> Grizzly bears, to be specific. I've read advice about how to give these types of speeches, and most of the advice I've read says, don't preach, which is great for me because I don't really have anything to preach about. You may assume that I'm here speaking to you because I was cum laude myself. I was not. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> Maybe somebody told the administration I was, and so there's your first lesson, check your sources. <laughs> In all honesty, I spent a lot of my time at Williston feeling like there was some measure of excellence that I came close to but never quite reached. I feel a bit like a fraud standing up here right now at a ceremony celebrating academic excellence. As Ms. Anderson can attest, she here? Yeah, I got a C plus in calculus. <laughs> Sometimes um, I felt like excellence at Williston was like, bestowed upon you from above. It could appear almost like by magic in many forms, making varsity, landing the lead in a play, getting an A, getting accepted to your first choice college. I know now that I was wrong to think that way, but you know, I was 16 and 16 year olds don't always have the best judgment. I mean, really guys, really YOLO? Really? 
actually. <laughs> what I've learned, what I'm still learning, is that excellence is about working hard, really day, re really hard every day to try to make things better, whether anyone is watching or not. That there's beauty in that struggle. Preparing for today, I read some of the other speeches that have been given at Williston recently. I actually enjoyed reading the talk Headmaster Hell gave at the opening of school this September. If you don't remember it because you were, I don't know, finishing your summer reading while you were supposed to be listening, um, he gave the following advice. Think small. I mean it. Not really, really small, but small enough. Take small, sure-footed steps at first, and giant leaps are sure to follow. This is good advice, advice that I found to be true in my life at Williston, in college, and at my job. I really want to tell you to dream big, to take this amazing Williston education you have and run out there and change the world, because the world needs it. President Obama told college grads in a commencement speech that there's nothing naive about your desire to change the world, but it's too easy to be overwhelmed if you're looking at change on that scale. If you only look at the big picture and expect to change the world like that, you can be cynical or overwhelmed. But focusing on the little things, things you can control, that's where the change is. Working hard in small ways every day is an act of optimism, of determination, of faith. I work for Verite, a global organization dedicated to helping companies like Apple, The Gap, Starbucks, learn about the lives of the actual people who make their products, your products, the things you eat, the things you wear, the things some of you are probably texting on right now. Someone made that. It's our job to make sure they do so safety, safe with safety, fair wages, and humane conditions. Maybe you heard about the recent factory fires in Bangladesh that killed more than 100 workers. That's why we're at work. This is 2013. Nobody should live like that. Nobody should die like that. This sort of work, corporate social responsibility, can be, as the tragedy in Bangladesh shows us, a matter of life or death. To address these problems in a meaningful way, companies often have to do hard work, work that nobody sees. You can make the argument that by doing that work, by being responsible, companies can actually earn more money. They can tell consumers like you, like us, about their good actions and will pay a premium for their products. And I think this is true to a large degree. But ultimately, companies that really want to do the right thing have to accept that their hard work, even though it is the most important moral and ethical work they can do to affect change, may not necessarily make them more money. But they know what's the right thing to do. Um, the CEO knows this. The salesman knows this. The consumer knows this. You knows this. You know this. You knows this. It's good. As the cliche goes, and I know that all of your English teachers, your great English teachers, like the Sawyers, yeah, um, are banging you over the head to avoid cliches, character is what you do when no one else is watching. And how to work hard, no matter what, is what Williston will teach you. It will teach you this almost in spite of yourself. You cum laude inductees are a great example of this hard work. So are the students, faculty, and staff at Williston who show up every day and do their own work. I want to tell you about a situation we see often in Verite. Don't worry, it's, n it's not bears, but we'll get to bears. Imagine you're 22 and you live in the Philippines. You went to st school to study computers, but when you graduated, you couldn't find work. You don't have money to support your family. You're getting discouraged. Then one day, you see an ad in the paper for high-paying jobs in a computer manufacturer in Taiwan. You meet with a recruiter, and he explains that you will get a really high-paying job, and all you have to do is pay him a fee up front. You don't have any money, so you go in debt to this recruiter, but you figure, no problem. I'm going to make all this money at my awesome new job. So then you arrive in Taiwan, and you meet with your new boss. He tells you that your salary is actually 50% of what you've been promised. Oh, and by the way, 50% of what you are making is going to go to pay your dorm money so you can live in a tiny dorm room with 10 other workers. You work seven days a week, 14 hours a day. 
Oh, and there's high interest on that debt you took out in the first place, so it's gonna take you like 20 years to pay it off. The more you work, the more you pay, and your debt is barely going down. You can't leave because if you did, you could never pay off your debt and you worry about the safety of your family back home. You're trapped. This is modern day slavery. This is a real situation that plays out in different variations all over the world, in every sector. In vegetable farming, on coffee plantations, in gold mines. We need to address these problems. And not with one sweeping heroic act like suddenly ending modern day slavery. It won't happen all at once. Instead, it's, it's lots of little acts. It's companies actively choosing to make sure they put real effort into knowing where they source their products from. It's companies setting up free hotlines so that workers who have problems can text anonymously. Change is companies who source from Bangladesh advocating for an independent fire chief to inspect their factories. Change is cocoa companies getting together to improve teacher trainings in rural Ghana so kids will spend their day in school rather than all day working on the family farm. Certainly none of these things alone are enough, but slowly things are getting better. Change requires companies to constantly evaluate the choices they make. Which factory should they use? How should they monitor that factory? It requires lots of spreadsheets and email and committee meetings. It requires consumers like you to ask questions of the companies you buy from and write emails if you're not happy with what you learn. It requires you, when you're on a weekend trip to the Holyoke Mall, to think, there is no way this $2 t-shirt was made by workers under fair conditions, so I'm not gonna buy it. This is the work that matters. Even in my own job, I've come up against this tension between the ideal of changing the world and the reality. I've been lucky to travel to some exciting places. Sometimes, on good days, about 5% of my time, my job brings me to families in mud huts in West Africa who farm the cotton some of you are wearing, or to fishing boats in Indonesia that are the beginning of a chain that leads, maybe even tonight, to your dinner in the dining hall. The other 95% of the time, my job is me. In a desk, at a desk, in a basement, staring at an Excel spreadsheet. Sometimes I come up against my own cynicism. I tell you this not to discourage you, but to highlight the fact that sometimes the most challenging, detail-oriented, dare I say, occasionally boring work is where the change happens. There's this narrative we have around hard work in our culture, that if you work hard, it will lead to success. We see it in classic sports movies. We see it in political discourse that tells struggling families to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. It's embedded in the myth of the rugged American individual. Hard work equals success. Well, sometimes. If hard work equaled financial success, the woman farmers I met in West Africa would be billionaires. Some of the times I work the hardest, well, exhibit A, the C plus in calculus. Or in soccer practice, working hard in soccer practice only to sit on the bench during the playoffs. There was no string music, no triumphant late entry to the game where I scored the winning goal, just a cold bench in November and a feeling that I'd failed, that I didn't live up to the excellence Williston expected of me, that I expected of me. I'm grateful for it now, I wasn't at the time, but just because the outcome wasn't what I wanted didn't mean the work wasn't worth it, didn't mean I would take that work back if I had the chance. I sat in this chapel recently for the wedding of a dear friend. He was a senior at Williston when I was a freshman. I'd always looked up to him. Um, his younger sister, my best friend at Williston, was the maid of honor. He was married here in a lovely ceremony in July. I cried when he and his husband walked down the aisle, a legally married couple. I was sitting right back there next to legendary former teacher Ann Van at the ceremony. And she leaned over to me and said, you know, when you were at Williston, this wouldn't have been legal. In some ways, it seems like civil rights movements come all at once, in big, sweeping waves. In the words of Theodore Parker, a Boston abolitionist, the arc of moral history is long, but it bends towards justice. <clears throat> Activists for marriage equality have been working tirelessly for years on a host of wonky little issues, just as civil rights activists did. I believe that history bends towards justice, 
not out of fate or destiny, but as a result of all these little choices we can make or not make. These little daily actions are often the hardest for me. I'm impatient. I jump from one thing to another without finishing what I was working on in the first place. I get distracted by something newer, bigger, shinier. I take shortcuts. I struggle with this. At the same time, these little changes are what I believe in. I was, um, I was hiking in Glacier National Park with my family this summer, and side note, go now while you still can. The glaciers are melting little by little. They are just, they're gonna be gone. And then we're gonna have to rename it Gravel National Park, and nobody wants to go to Gravel National Park. <laughs> anyway, we're at a glacier, and being the slightly nerdy family we are, hi guys, <laughs> we attended a geology talk given by a young park ranger. She asked the audience to shout out what we thought of as geological forces affecting the rocks in the park. Glacial movement, someone yelled. Wind and rain. Plate tectonics, someone said. There was one thing we were all missing. Thoughts? Bears. Yeah, bears. Bears, both black and grizzly, eat berries and grubs. To get at these treats, they dig up the earth under rocks. They paw through brush. They move so much dirt over their life that they are considered a geological force. This is how change gets made. The daily grind of bears digging up grubs, doing your homework even when you're tired, working hard in practice, staring at spreadsheets, doing the right thing when no one is watching, small steps with sure footing. This is how the world changes. This is how slavery ends, how civil rights are won, and how landscapes change. The hard work you're doing now is worth it. You may think you're just waiting to start the real work, but here's the best part. You're already doing it. Keep going. Keep asking questions, keep working, keep digging. You'll move the earth. Thank you.